Welcome to the Lizzie Borden Podcast, Episode 20. I am your host, Stephanie Corey, filling in for the late Richard Behrens, author of the Lizzie Borden Girl Detective series of mysteries. In this episode, we interview Tom Moriello, a retired U.S. Special Agent, Professor of Criminal Justice and Forensic Science at the University of Maryland, and an accomplished author. Tom has a unique expertise on crime investigation and offers his own theories and thoughts on the Borden case. The Lizzie Borden Podcast is the only podcast entirely devoted to the study of the Borden murders of 1892, Lizzie Borden, and sometimes the history of her hometown, Fall River, Massachusetts. Produced by Nine Muses Books and Anna Behrens. Each episode explores some aspect of the mystery that is Lizzie Borden, From the origins of the doggerel, Lizzie Borden took an axe, to a primer on the case by noted authors and experts, including dramatic readings of Richard Behrens' Lizzie Borden Girl Detective Mystery Series. Please subscribe to us on YouTube so we can meet the magic number they have set for us to be able to remove advertisements, which we see no revenue from. And now, the Lizzie Borden Podcast presents an interview with Tom Moriello. Tom Moriello is an educator, author, forensic consultant, and public speaker who is a retired U.S. special agent and a former police officer and investigator. He presently is the founder and CEO of ForensIQ, a forensic consultant company. During the past 45 years, he has taught academic courses in criminal justice and forensic sciences and manage the criminal laboratory for the University of Maryland Department of Criminology and Criminal Justice. He is an American Academy of Forensic Sciences Fellow and an active member of the International Association of Identification. He is also an accomplished author who wrote the digital textbook, Introduction to Criminalistics, From Crime Scene to Courtroom, the legal treatise, Criminal Investigation Handbook, Strategy, Law, and Science, The Dollhouse Murders, illustrating crime scene dioramas used to study the crime scene investigation, CSI process, public speaking for criminal justice professionals, a manner of speaking, and most recently, the CSI checklist application. He is regularly interviewed on TV and radio news shows and is an on-camera consultant for TV real crime documentaries. Welcome, Tom. Stephanie, it's wonderful seeing you again and talking with you. It's been it's a while. Been a, yeah, it's been a while. It's been too long. Too long, I know. Well, we've I talked know. during COVID, but it's not the same thing. As a professor of forensics at the University of Maryland, which is what you, you're, are you a professor emeritus now or? Oh, no, I, I've been, I was an adjunct professor because I was working full time for the government the whole 45 years that I was oh. teaching. So, wow. so, um, so. I'm on a yearly contract and I'm the only one who teaches forensic science. So I always get my contract. Mm-hmm. Well, you, your version of something that you did was, I think, based on Francis Glasner Lee's nutshell studies, and you called them dollhouse investigations. For those not familiar, uh, Lee founded the Department of Legal Medicine at Harvard in 1936. And in the 40s and the 50s, she built these small dollhouse crime scenes based on real cases to train detectives to assess visual evidence. And their scale was like one to 12 with a high level of detail, which surprises me. Pencils would write, window shades moved, and clues to the crimes are revealed to those who study the case scenes carefully. So it sounds like the cases were already solved but these were representations of those solved cases that then they could resolve. So it sounds a little bit like Sherlock Holmes to me with powers of observation, but you're dollhouses. Now you use dioramas. What was their scale and how effective do you think the visual clue gathering became in your training of forensic science? Well, well, let me just say how I got to that point. I used to have a, a a house, a completely furnished house uh, on campus that I used to use. And they took it away because they wanted to build a high rise student apartment building. 
So I had to come up with something. And because I was familiar with the the office of the medical examiner in, in Baltimore and had seen those dollhouses, I uh, thought there would be a great opportunity because I didn't have the, uh, that house. So My, the house uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. The house was actually a crime scene house? Well, it was a house that one of the departments on campus was using for seminars, uh, a family studies uh, department where they wanted oh. to have these uh, seminars in a family setting. Oh, okay. So it was per- so it was completely furnished and they allowed me to use it as a crime scene uh, when <laughs> I was uh, for my class. But unfortunately it went away and I had to do something. And uh, the my dioramas were the same size. I, I referred to them as a one inch scale, one inch for every foot. So there were individual rooms. We commissioned a dollhouse company uh, to build the basic rooms. Five of the six of them, we made up the crime scene. We just, we made up the case. One of them was an actual case that I had um, been involved with. So the dollhouse company would create the diorama for us with the basic furniture and et cetera. And then I got some uh, graphic artists to help me create the specific evidence, the blood spatter. Uh, you know, we had to figure out what what is a gunshot? Sh- what's a shell going to look like? We actually used the end of a mechanical pencil. You know, that little piece of metal at yep. the end? Well, that, that became a, a shell. And the actual lead of a pencil became a bullet. Uh, so we tried to make it as realistic as possible. And for, my God, almost 14 years, I used those in the lab to give the students an opportunity to put into practice some of the crime scene investigation uh, skills and techniques that they had learned. It it worked out very, very well. You know, they certain they couldn't take crime scene photographs and stuff like that, but they really were able to be engaged. The nutshell dollhouse was used by uh, the Harvard Associates. Harvard Associates was the homicide training school that she was involved with. And they were headquartered in Baltimore. So all those dollhouses are actually in Baltimore. Now, whether they still use them or not, I don't know. I know they're on display there. That's really interesting. It seems obvious now when you think about it as a visualization in miniature of an actual crime scene, as opposed to trying to map it out or draw it out in one dimension. To have Mm -hmm. the three-dimensional aspect of it seems really helpful. And I I alluded to the Sherlock Holmes powers of observation, but that seems to be the point, right? It's Mm -hmm. what do you see, what does it mean, and what can you deduce from what you're looking at? Absolutely. And they could actually, you know, take, pick up the body and examine it closely. It was in my opinion, much better than having a one-dimensional or two-dimensional software on a computer. That's interesting. Let's talk about your forensic, is it called Forensic IQ? I just say forensic. I just say forensic IQ. Okay, forensic IQ app. And it's an actual app that you can use on your phone or your iPad. Now, how did you come up with this idea and how is it in use right now? I came up with the idea because I identified a necessity. When I left the government and created Forensic IQ and I started working uh, for clients, all my clients were defense attorneys. So I was working on the other side of the fence. And my job as a forensic consultant is to review a criminal case from crime scene to, to crime lab and see what the police did or didn't do, what mistakes they made, what did they not do, et cetera. And I found that my 45 years of training over 9,000 students wasn't helping very well. We provide these people with skills, but there's too many things to do at one time. There's over 150 different things that need to be considered when you respond to a scene of a crime. And there's no human being could possibly remember all those things. Or if you're a police officer in some Midwest uh, small town and you never you never investigated a rape and now it's three o'clock in the morning and you're sitting there with a rape victim and you're trying to remember what you might have learned in the police academy years before, even if you took a special course in it, it's three in the morning and you're there. What do you have besides your gun, your phone, mm-hmm. your phone? Right. And today's generation of young police officers, you know, we used to use checklists, hard, hard copy checklists. We always did for years. But 
They're not there. They're not always there. Uh, the United States Department of Justice have has created uh, standards for all the different types of of crime scenes and 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 cases. They were all listed there. They were put together by experts uh, in the field, and nobody does anything with them. So, mm. I decided to to create an app and to gather all those standards, those those proven standards and put them in a checklist, just like a checklist that a a pilot uses before he or she's getting ready to to fly a plane. In fact, I found this book called The Checklist Manifesto by Dr. Atul Gawande, who's a surgeon in Boston. Uh, He's a Harvard professor. He wrote a book about the importance of checklists, that no matter how smart you are, no 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 matter how much uh, skills you have in knowledge, it's difficult to remember various things. He found out in the medical profession that people were dying in operating rooms, not for what brought them there, but for mistakes that were made during the process. And I have I have my own personal experience of uh, my best friend in Melrose, Massachusetts. His sister, I had a cyst on her shoulder and she was going to the Melrose Wakefield Hospital to have the cyst removed. Her husband dropped her off, said, I'll be back in a couple hours to pick you up. And uh, she had four little children, four little girls. And two different nurses injected her with a a medicine, a drug that instantly killed her. Mm. Instantly killed her because two different, one person didn't know the other person did it, et cetera. So that's an example of how the medical profession, the aviation profession, contractors, high-rise buildings. If you think for one minute, high-rise buildings go up without significant checklists and ensuring that everybody's doing the right thing at the right time. So I felt that the uh, criminal justice profession needed to have the same thing. I found out there was no such animal out there. When I went to have it registered, that's one of the things they have to see if there's something else like it. Nothing's like it. So when, in fact, I used the checklist to evaluate the Lizzie Borden investigation. Uh, And I checked off the things that should have been done. And I have it right near me. As they check it off, you know, it has observations to be made, activities to do, questions to ask. It's all there. If you have a bar- Let's talk about that. Let's talk about your checklist, your Lizzie checklist, since we're there. Figured you were going to do that. (laughs) Because you and I both know that the, the poor police officers, they were ridiculed for being kind of keystone copish, but they, they weren't necessarily, it was a part of, they weren't detectives. They were constabulary. They didn't, they didn't have experience, a lot of experience with hand, handling murders. And a lot of the police force was off at Rocky Point for a day of, of picnicking. So we were left with a skeleton crew of various kinds of police officers from an inspector, a state inspector, that that may mean that he's an ins- someone who inspects, not necessarily an inspector like Inspector Gadget. But there was a state detective, there, was, there were patrolmen. That's what we had an intake officer first on the scene. These are the kinds of people that were involved in the initial investigation. And they all seem to be doing things different from one another and not keeping notes, not recording the times, not securing the crime scene, which are all very modern understandings of how you handle a crime scene. So I can imagine they missed almost everything. Well, I want you to understand, Stephanie, those things are happening today. Oh, wow. 2022. And how do I know that? Because when I when I have a client, when I look at a crime scene, I'm I'm just shocked. I'll I'll always say to the, the defense attorney, hey, you don't seem to have all the all the reports here. There's things missing. Oh no, that's all of it. And I'm saying they didn't even declare a crime scene. Or, you know, I, I did a, a murder in New York in a in a in a county in New York. A two and a half year old little girl was killed. And the sheriff's department normally didn't handle murders they would re, uh, the, the state police would come in mm-hmm. but they first thought this was an accidental death so they handled it as an accident 
until they realized, hey, this wasn't an accident. The manner of death, in fact, is they believed was homicide. But they had already started the investigation, so they convinced the state police to handle it well. I mean, there was so many things they didn't do and missed. It, it, it was sad. It was sad. That's now, like the John Vinay Ramsey case. They started oh out God. with the kidnapping. Oh, I could talk about the yeah. John Vinay Ramsey case over and over and over again. Yeah. And, and it, they just don't do the best things. That's why I believe my app is, is so important. Now, you you talked about they didn't they didn't take notes. That's the very first one I checked here. They didn't begin to take notes. They didn't do that. Be aware of anyone or anything at or leaving the crime scene. Who was there and who was leaving? That needs to be done. But as soon as you determine that you have a crime, you have to stop time and you have to move everybody out of the crime scene. They never did that. Right. They never did that. Uh, everybody in that house, including uh, Lizzie Borden, should have been removed from that house. And then they should have established the, the perimeter of that crime scene. They never did that. Right. So anybody had an opportunity to to destroy evidence, to pick up evidence, to take it with them. Well, Pretty they did. There were some no, no fewer than seven doctors on the scene who just wandered by. One would happen to be the coroner who was passing through, but there were other doctors involved and they picked up Abby and they put their fingers in her wounds and they looked her over and they, you know, got their hands all bloody and they laid her back down and sat her up and then laid her back down again. And they probably did the same with Andrew. And then they would wash their hands in the basin, in the basin, in the room, the water basin. So there but, was, you know, you know, Stephanie, we really don't know what really happened. You know, I love Bill Spencer's two books. I have them both. And I read and I, I'm, a, I'm not done with the second one. All right. Uh, and one point I want to make that the only thing I disagree with Bill is that Bill believes that that if, if he has information that is from a, a transcript in the court, that that's factual information. It isn't. That's you're, you're assuming that somebody gave testimony that was telling the truth or really knew what they were talking about. And right. you don't know that. You right. don't know that. That there's nobody alive today who lived through that process, you know. And um, I've read a lot of books and I know you've read them all and <laughs> written them and everything else. And we always can say, well, this person is wrong, that person's wrong. I don't, you know, we just really don't know. And if we were to, try to say, can we, will we ever solve this crime? Well, absolutely not. There's no way for two reasons. One, because too much evidence was lost to uh, too many observations that should have been made at the beginning weren't made. And you can't, you can't go back that we always tell police officers when you leave the crime scene, you can't go back. You can't, I mean, you can, but I mean, you, you can't, uh, nothing's going to be the same. Nothing's going to be the same. During the O.J. Simpson case, because LAPD had this rule that the main investigator had to be there when the medical examiner responded to the scene. Well, Tom Lang, who worked with me in the in the Lizzie Borden documentary, he couldn't be there right away because he had to go to O.J. Simpson's house because they, they were trying to get a search warrant to get into the house because they were afraid something may have happened to O.J. Simpson. Little did they know that he was the one that killed the two people, even though he's been found not guilty. Yes. So what happened was he instructed, do not call the medical examiner until I can get back. Well, that was seven hours later. Oh, Those wow. bodies laid there for seven hours. Every minute a body lays there, it changes and you lose significant information. And, you know, when we were doing the documentary, I argued with him till the cows came out. I said, Tom, I know you had a regulation, but that was just wrong. That was just wrong. You know, you, you needed to get a medical exam in there as soon as possible. Couldn't he have sent somebody else to the OJ house? Yes. He could <laughs> okay. Have. Okay. He could, he he could, could have. have stayed with the bodies, which he is the crime at hand. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. So what else did the cops not do at the Lizzie Board? Okay. So we go down here. Uh, Treat the location as a crime scene. So in other words, they needed to literally establish 
How far away the crime scene? Where do we stop? You know, up front, you don't know the, the facts of the case. So you have to go beyond what you even think the crime scene may be. So for her, then, it's just the whole yard and the barn. Oh, God, yes. Yeah. Outside the fence line, nobody yeah. should have been beyond there. Nobody. Okay. And one of the things, again, reading all the different books and, and specifically uh, Bill, I loved Bill Spencer's book. It, you know, I just liked the way it was written, et cetera. The police searched the house several different times. Yes. Well, it should have only been one time yeah. and it should have been done right the first time. And it wasn't. For example, you know, we're all concerned about whether Lizzie burned a dress or didn't burn a dress, et cetera. Well, the bottom line is, if they had properly searched that house, they would have found that dress because right. obviously she had it somewhere. Right. <laughs> and the first search of of, uh, of evidence didn't come up with it. So where was it? You know, well, it and was a lot of propriety's sake when they were talking about her menstrual cycle and their bloody rags in the cellar. I mean, they didn't want to talk about it. They just talked to the doctor and he said, oh, it's OK. It's OK. You don't have to look at that. The well, doctor, the doctor has no idea. No, no. You know, a medical examiner, a doctor, their responsibility is the body and that's it. And they're to determine possible time of death manner of death and there are five minutes of death homicide suicide accident natural and the last one i love i don't know i don't know and that is a manner of death there is many times when the medical examiner cannot make that decision right right you know we talked about uh, determine the perimeter of the crime scene identify persons at the crime scene i'm going down here um let me see items used to commit the offense so okay it didn't take long before anybody believed that the two victims were probably assaulted with some type of a cutting instrument, whether it be an ax, a hatchet, or whatever. So anything in that house that looked like a cutting instrument should have been collected. There, you know, we had that box with several different where they found the, the head, the handle had been cut off. There's some some people said that they they had the handle and nobody knows where it went. And some people said they didn't see the handle. I don't, I don't know. As you know, I had that hatchet head in my hand. Yeah. And uh, the end, after many, 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 many years, it was hard to tell whether it had been sawed off or what happened. But certainly, whether there was any blood or presence of blood, allegedly, it was looked at and they didn't find any. But I use the word allegedly very loosely. Well, they couldn't even determine type of blood. So it was animal or human, and that's all they could do. Yeah. Well, they, they today, the, yeah, yeah. yeah, there's there's three things that we do with, with biological fluid. First, we do, we do a presumptive test to see if it's if it possibly is uh, blood. If we get a positive reaction, again, that's just a presumptive test. It's a field test. If we get a positive reaction, then we go to the next test, and that's when we, when we determine whether it's animal or human blood. If it becomes human, then we go to the third one, and that's the DNA. Mm -hmm. That's DNA, you know. And I did a case, a murder case in Baltimore, again, working for the defense, where the crime lab skipped over the second one. They didn't bother to determine whether it was male or female. All they did is do it. They did a presumptive test that it might be blood. It might be blood. So we were able to argue that, hey, look at, yeah, there was a DNA on our client's jacket, but we haven't determined whether that, that DNA right. was from blood. It could have come from other things. Right. You know, so the, the lab not doing the right test caused that problem to be that way. But, you know, declare location again, list who was present. You know, we don't know who was there and who wasn't there exactly. Determine the, the path of exit and entrance. They had to somehow, if somebody, if it wasn't Lizzie, all right, somebody had to come into that house and leave. Right. And one of the things that would be very important is try to determine the entrance and exit of a possible suspect. Now, did they look for that? I don't know. Maybe there wasn't any anyways, because if Lizzie was involved, then we know where she was for the most part. Well, they were very, very particular about which doors were locked, which doors were unlocked. 
how they knew that. They made Bridget testify as to the back door and the front door. They had Lizzie testify at the inquest as to the back door and the front door. And the pattern of the daily opening of the locks and the closing of the door and who was responsible for what. So they spent a great deal of time trying to determine what avenue of escape any intruder could have taken. And it all depended on who opened the front door or who locked the front door or who opened the side door and who escaped from the side door. Uh, um, did, did they check the windows? Did they personally check to see if windows were locked and not it, locked? There's no evidence of that. There's no evidence of that. So that's another way to get into the house. We keep talking yeah. about the doors, but there's you no. Know, so they needed to check every window and see if they were locked or uh, unlocked. If, you know, Again, now fingerprints back then it existed, but I don't I don't know of, of any fingerprint evidence that I remember reading during that. No, uh, it was um it was only in um a little bit later than that at the turn of the century in 1900 that it started in New York. It was in Europe. It was being done in Europe, but it wasn't being done in the United States in 1893. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it was almost like the perfect time for this crime. It was before, before, before. So they could determine the time of death, the approximate time of death due to digestion, not liver mortis, you know, not taking the temperature of the liver, but by digestion. And all they could do is determine that she had died first by at least an hour or an hour and a half than him because they ate breakfast at the same time that morning. And they ate the same and they basic ate the kind same, of food. Same food. But does does digestion have to do with body mass? Um, is her weight have anything to do with how quick or slow she digests food? He's walking downtown and back. Does that make a difference in his digestive process? Does he digest faster because he's being active as opposed to her, who may not be as active going walking around? So there's still lots of questions about that. Well, that first of all, there's there's no evidence that can prove exact time of death. Nothing. Right. No, it, no. It's it's a collecting of all these things. For example, you mentioned temperature of the body. They don't even they don't even check temperature of the body anymore because there's too many oh. variables involved. Oh, I see. You know, it, you know, the temperature of the room um, can affect it, etc. So it's really not very helpful. The liver mortis. It's different from one person to another. Whether they just got through doing exercise or not, or walking, like you said, or not. Um, etc. But you know, what's really interesting to me that nobody really made a big deal about the fact that she alleged that the stepmother got a, a, a note and she allegedly oh, that's, responded. Yeah, that's the, you biggest, know? the biggest weirdness. And yeah. not one person came forward to said, oh, I'm the one that was sick and I'm yeah. the one that wrote the note. Yeah. Now, come on. You know, but listen, Tom, the note makes no logical sense. Mm -hmm. It makes no sense. Why would she say such a thing? except to get it into Andrew's head why Abby isn't around. That's the only thing. Because there was no note. Bill Spencer proves it in his book about the timeline of who was where, when, and who was told what, when. So why make up something like that that would then make no, would confound everyone when it came to, why did you say that? And then I'll for her to say, oh, she's, I heard her come in. What do you mean you heard her come in? When did when, you hear her come in? When you're lying, it's very <laughs> difficult to be consistent in your stories. All right. When you're telling the truth, telling the truth is just the easiest thing in the world. It's what is, you know. I just got through with a case. Belize, Central America is where this woman killed her husband. And every time she was interviewed, she said something different, you know, uh, you know, she, to a point where she tried to say that her husband, who was her uncle, by the way, shot himself in the back of the head. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I know right. that can have. Yeah. And then <laughs> after after he allegedly shot himself in the back of the head, she spooned him for two hours, waiting him for him to wake up. Okay. Okay. Now the pro the problem is that when she shot him in the back of the head, he didn't die right away. And she had, and she couldn't shoot him again because you can't. People who commit suicide don't get a chance to shoot themselves twice, right. usually. Okay, yeah. and that's one of the things. That's a technique. You keep asking them the same questions over and over again to see, you know, how the story changes. And, and when you're telling the truth, the story never changes. Yeah, because Lizzie was questioned by 
four or five different police officers that day. And they asked very simple questions and wanted to know some basic information. It didn't bother her that much about it. It was no interrogation. It was a couple of questions. And the kinds of questions were, where were you during this period of time? And her story of going to the barn changed. The time she was out of the house changed. That she, first she was in the backyard eating pears. Then she was in the barn eating pears. Then she was gone 30 minutes. Then she was gone 20 minutes. And she kept adjusting the time. That, so what does that tell you? What does that tell you? Well, it tells you she's either very upset and her brain isn't working, or she's trying to come up with an answer that seems to get her out of the house during the second murder. Yeah. You know, yeah. an alibi. Yeah. Well, the uh, you know, and then the officer, Officer Allen, I think it was Allen, uh, is he the one who went, no, it's not Allen, who went up into the barn loft and didn't write down his experiment. He didn't write down that he was watching the barn. He went up to the loft and he looked for her footprints or looked for any footprints and all he could see was dust. Right. So then he comes back down and he testifies to that. And then they bring in Barlow and Brownie and they say, oh, we were up there before him and we were up in the bar loft and we were walking around. And, you know, so they made the police officer look like a fool because he never told anybody that he had conducted this, quote, experiment. And individual police officers conducted all these different experiments. So one went on the back but fence and walked the back fence to see if it could be done. You know, they just. Nobody was ordering anybody. There was nobody in charge of the case. And it wasn't properly reported. You call them experiments. They're basic observations that police officers should have been making in reporting. And the list know, of dresses in the dress mm -hmm. in the dress closet, in the clothes press. There had been a list made of all the dresses in the clothes press that was lost. So, okay, so we don't know what you saw. We don't know how many dresses were in there. We don't know what their color was. We don't know if the paint stain dress was in there because you lost your list. And you, and you, you mentioned five officers uh, interviewed Lizzie. I'm not, you know, whatever the number is, only, only one officer should have been questioning her. Only one. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you never have multiple people asking questions to the same person. You just, you just don't. Uh, and by the way, we don't interrogate anymore. We interview. Oh, okay. okay. I stand corrected. Okay. <laughs> well, you and I met when we were making the documentary you mentioned before. This was back in 2004. Uh, mm -hmm. Lizzie Borden had an ax. Uh, you were the forensic guy, Tom Lang, who I didn't meet. You didn't all. meet Tom? No, I never met him. No. You guys were, I was in Florida and you were in Fall River doing the show. Mm -hmm. and. They had a dollhouse there that was to die for. And seriously, a great dollhouse. It was as big as you are, almost sat on a big table. Did you have anything to do with that dollhouse being constructed or did they get the idea from your own book? The reason why they had that dollhouse was because of my book. Oh, wow. uh, they, they wanted to use that as a technique. And that dollhouse, the paint on that dollhouse was wet when we were shooting that because they, <laughs> the man who did it literally finished it minutes before we were on camera. It was beautiful. It was yes. just beautiful. And it, and it, and they, they did it in le in levels so that you, they could take the, you know, the, the top, uh, the roof off, then the second floor, the first floor. And it was, it was really well done. It allowed us to demonstrate the different things that, we believed happened. And just so you know, that the last time I talked to the production company, um, Morningstar Entertainment, yes. uh, they had that in their warehouse. And they had that. I talked to them too it. about it. And they said, Oh, we we don't know. We think we kept it. We're not sure. Cause I was saying I wanted a I wanted it and I didn't right. know where I'd put it. But and I knew that you wanted it and I never did find out whatever happened to it. Well, I'm going to send him an, uh, an email and tell him that we want it. He's he's from Boston. By the way, he's from Boston. Tim uh, Evans? Guy, yeah. Um, yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. Tim Evans, was the, he was the producer. No, the person who owned the company. Oh, I, I see. It, I just forget his name offhand. Uh, he's, he's from Massachusetts. That's one of the reasons why he called me and asked me to do it. You oh, know, he, cool. he saw that I was from Massachusetts and he figured, oh, you know, I know all about Lizzie Borden, you know. 
which I didn't at the time, but I, I certainly do now. You certainly do now. Yeah. And um, the show had this luminol thing that I, I thought was the best part of the show besides the dollhouse personally. That's because it was colorful. It was colorful. It, it was, because it was visual. Well, it didn't prove anything other than showing us something that had never been seen before. So what they did was they called me when I was in Florida and they said, oh, we're at the house. We have the luminol. Where do we spray it? And I'm like, oh, you're asking me? And and so I got off the phone. I said, let me call you back. And I called my sister and she suggested. And then I called them back and said, spray in the cellar, in the ceiling, underneath the, the sitting room where the couch was against the wall. And sure enough, when they sprayed there, it lit up like a Christmas tree. I'm the one who sprayed it. Yeah, yeah. I know. And yeah. It, it was... It was the first time that that blood that had seeped through from the floor before above had been seen, in a sense, on camera. And so it was, to me, it was a big deal because it was new evidence. It didn't prove anything. Right. It didn't help the case at all. But it was something that nobody had ever seen before. And that was the coolest thing about it. I also got a, a reaction on the brick wall next to the box where the hatchet head was supposed to have been in. Yeah. That, that corner. And I sprayed the um, sprayed luminol on the bricks and only a certain area of it responded. Now, that, that doesn't mean it was it was blood because luminol respond, will, will react to a number of things. But I'll tell you. But in my mind, when I wear that respondent underneath the floorboards in between the cracks and everything else, yeah. I, I I was convinced. In fact, uh, Searchy Laboratories, who's who's the company where I got the luminol, they were just amazed. I said, look at, I mean, we're talking over 100 years old because they never knew how, how long luminol. Oh, so would, did it help them in determining the well, I mean, blood? Yeah, well, the, the problem is that I took samples to, to have a lab see we could still find blood after 100 at the time it was like 112 years or whatever it was and uh they didn't want to spend the money to have the oh, have it tested do you still have the do you still have the samples do you know right behind me and i believe i still have the samples um in a brown bag cuz you always put biological fluids in a a container that will breathe um i still have them i still have well, them. i wonder I, why they put stuff in brown bags Oh, yeah, because if you don't, uh, well, what happened in the O.J. Simpson case is, remember, uh, Ron Goldman's shirt was full of blood, and they were trying to determine whether O.J.'s blood was on it, so they put it in a plastic bag. Well, you put it in a plastic bag, it doesn't breathe, and mold immediately is created, and it destroys the uh, the value. I, re I learned that when I was a young investigator investigating a rape, where I... I collected biological fluids on a couch where the rape occurred, and I clearly could see biological fluids, and it wasn't blood, okay? Mm -hmm. And I collected it. I very carefully folded it, and I put it in a nice, tight, plastic evidence bag, sent it to the FBI, and weeks later, I said, hey, did you get any? Now, this is before DNA now, so I, all we would have got was blood, you know, blood type. I said, did you get any, uh, the blood type? Uh, for the semen because you know sperm and they said there was none there i said what do you mean there was none there i saw it i know what it looks like and it was there mm -hmm. and they said it's probably because you put it in a in a plastic bag and it was sealed and it just, it, it destroys the uh the biological fluid properties oh my god so yeah. they have the plastic bags for some things and then anything that has biological matter on it like clothing right or, or anything else has to go in plastic that right. makes sense that, you know, yeah. I never, they never explained that. Don't or any, any object now, now that we have touched DNA, you know, like you, you could find DNA on almost anything now. So it makes sense not to put it in plastic bags, just put it in a, uh, a paper bag or an envelope. An envelope will breathe also. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Do you think besides that blood that we saw, is there anything that you can think of that's left to discover about this case as far as forensic evidence um yeah uh Ooh, what during during the time that we were uh doing the uh documentary in 2004 
Morning Star Entertainment had made contact with uh, Lizzie Borden's law firm that still exists. I don't, I mean, obviously the, the, lawyers, law firm, the right? lawyers don't exist, but uh, the firm does. Yes. Allegedly, they have notes that were written by Lizzie Borden during the right. time she was in jail. She had a quite she was given a questionnaire by her lawyer. And well, beyond that, her. just notes, uh, you know, that she sent to people. There's there's documents that we wanted to see that they wouldn't let us see. And uh, I really think there'd be something to be learned from whatever they're, they've got protected. And we also we said, well, Lizzie, there's no more Borden people alive. Now, there was somebody in some Midwestern some distant relative that lived in some Midwestern state. And they even contacted that, per contacted that person. That person said, we don't care. I don't care. And uh, the law firm would not allow us to see it. But that's because they were claiming attorney-client privilege still prevailed after all these years. Because and, the and, firm exists. Yeah, and I just don't believe it. Well, they but, took it but, to the actual, the Massachusetts Superior Supreme Court, actually, the Supreme Court of Massachusetts, because somebody sued them in order to get access to the Robinson file on the case. Mm -hmm. And their argument was the slippery slope argument and they prevailed. So they did not have to open up their files on the case, even though it's in the public interest and even though everybody's dead because mm -hmm. the law firm still exists. Whereas other law firms like you know, Jennings, who was her personal attorney, his family, had his information and his family had the hip bath collection. So that's all the evidence that was presented at trial went to her attorney and he donated it to the historical society. His family did. Mm -hmm. And there was no problem with that because the law firm was dissolved upon his death. So right. there was no need for them to say, oh, 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 you can't have this. I think it's a very slim argument to say yeah. that when we don't know what they have and they won't tell us. For instance, right. for yeah. instance the, the uh, volume one of the inquest, Lizzie Borden's inquest and, and Bridget Sullivan's inquest is lost. Somebody loaned it to somebody and it doesn't exist anymore. I have searched personally through archives and personal papers and holdings of everybody in the case that exists that donated documents and it's nowhere. And the only place I think it might be is in the Robinson file. Now, the inquest is public information. It was created with public funds. It is a public document and should be made kept public, like the trial transcripts. But they're still holding on to it. And I'm like, hey, if there's marginalia in there that's legal, you know, black it out, redact it, but still release the information. But they I was, no. yeah, I was listening to you and Bill uh, when when Bill was on um, the podcast he had the last time. And I don't know whether you asked or you were talking about why you believe the uh, the testimony uh, of Lizzie Boyd and the inquest wasn't allowed in the trial. And there was several different theories in that. But one of the theories that I, I know I read in several places and and it made sense was that prior to her testifying in the inquest, uh, allegedly, the mayor had mentioned to her that she was under uh, suspicion. Yes. And because he was a member of, you know, the establishment, the government, that she should have been advised that she did not have to testify in the inquest. Right. Even though uh, Miranda, uh, the right. Supreme Court didn't formally say it till uh, 1966, those rights have been with us since day one. And uh, that was the reason I understood that it wasn't allowed in the trial. Maybe, I, you know, again, I read that, but again, we read a lot of things and we just don't really know, but that would, that would make the most sense to me. And that's right. why uh, the, the judge wouldn't have let it in. Well, he also didn't let in the prussic acid testimony and. Well, that's that, part of it, but well, that's yeah. part. Yeah. Yeah, but that was in the uh, in the inquest that was well, discussed. Well, Vince was Vince's testimony in the inquest was there. He was testified at the preliminary hearing. He he was allowed to testify at the preliminary hearing, which was just a uh, you know it wasn't 
it was a, a one-sided case. Um, mm -hmm. He testified at the grand jury. He testified all, to, all over the place, but he wasn't allowed to testify at the trial. And it's a kind of perplexing. And it's interesting that Knowlton, the district attorney, knew that his case was sunk when he couldn't get those two things in. He had yeah. no case. But what else do you think is available out there that, that could be investigated that uh, we can find still that might make us get all excited? What kind of forensic evidence is there? Doesn't take much sometimes. No, it doesn't take excited. much. Yeah. <laughs> but, okay. I, you know, something that we tried to do and then uh, what's it, uh, Star tried to do also is Professor Stars, uh, ex yeah. exhume, you know, exhume the bodies and prove one way or another whether that hatchet had had anything to do uh, with the crime. You know, I believe that uh, it's very possible that there are enough striation marks on the uh, on the skull to prove or disprove that that hatchet head was involved. If it proves it was, it doesn't it doesn't prove that Lizzie Borden did it. But then we have to say, OK, if someone else did it outside of the house, why would they go in, uh, take the handle off and then hide it? in the house like that how how would they have time to do that um, etc the other thing is i don't i haven't read a lot about my theory about where's the blood you know everybody talks about where's the blood she didn't have any blood on her i'm right, right. i i'm convinced that she was behind the wall in the dining room that she well, was that, in the dining that, room that's very common theory about where the killer might have stood absolutely yeah and that she wrapped his coat around her arm uh huh and why would he why would his coat be wrapped up and put underneath his head? Why would he do that? All right. I'll tell you why, because she That's could have wrapped. She, yeah, yeah it was, she wrapped it up. So all the blood wouldn't matter because she's, she's, she's going to put it underneath uh, his head. So now she doesn't have any blood. Really? She might well, have what a little about the first crime. She has no blood on her from that. Yeah, but she had an hour or so to take care of that. <laughs> okay so you know, you're talking about the five minutes or the th four minutes between okay I yeah see. she only had a short amount of time after andrew was was killed but okay. she had more time when um, the, the mother was killed that's true that's true somebody had suggested the skulls are separate from the bodies they're buried on top of the caskets but not at the caskets because they were removed during the autopsy yeah. at the cemetery for that and stupid then, demonstration that did them no good at all right just created a, a real fear fearer in the court so when the skulls were returned to her she had them reinterred in the graves but i think from my investigation they're separate they're in a, a special box and I don't think they dug them back up again and put mm -hmm. the heads back in the caskets because as far as I know, they were concreted or bricked over. So that would mean that they're down there. So digging up the skulls, for instance, would not be a humongous project. Digging right. up the bodies themselves right. would be a big deal. But would there be any reason to dig up the bodies for, say, defensive wounds or anything like that that they've never investigated? Mm -hmm. Would that matter? I don't think so at this point. You know, just like the uh, the crime scene picture of Andrew and the way he was uh, laying there. And every time you see a documentary, including ours, uh, which was not what we suggested, it gives the appearance that Andrew saw the his eyes opened up as he saw the, the hatchet coming down on him. Well, his body in the manner it is sitting, doesn't reflect that. If he was involved in any type of defensive act and saw the a hatchet or whatever coming towards him, his sympathetic nervous system would immediately respond and his arms would immediately came up in a protective way. Okay. And he wouldn't have to think about it. It's just, it's, nat it's natural. It's, it's just sympathetic nervous system trying to protect itself. Plus, when that happens, what happens is a cadaveric spasm. Instantaneous rigor occurs in the arms and the extremities when that happens. In other words, it takes, it takes you know, 12, 16, 18 hours for the body to go into rigor. But if your sympathetic nervous system has uh, seen death coming, you get 
It's called instantaneous rigor or cadaveric oh, wow. spasm. The arms come up. I can show you pictures of bodies that are laying on their back with their arms straight up in the air in a crossed position, like they were protecting themselves. Wow. And the body is relaxed because rigor mortis hasn't set in yet, but their arms are stiff. The rest of the body gets stiff and then it all goes away. Goes away. Rigor mortis goes away approximately 48 hours afterwards. Again, it's different depending on the circumstances, what the body was, the person was doing before they died and all those other things. Yeah, so, oh, that's very interesting. So the fact that he's laying there with his arms down like that tells you that he was hit from behind, almost certainly. Well, he wasn't awake, put it this way. He didn't, he, he didn't open his eyes to see anything coming. Okay. You know? Okay. But and, Abby, on the other hand, saw it coming. She was well, facing her attacker when she was hit the first time. Well, that's what that's what we read, anyways. Well, the yeah. first wound was on the yeah a flap wound up to the front of the face by yeah. the ear, and it made the ear flap back. That's what they called the flap wound. There mm -hmm. were wounds to the back of the head, but there were wounds to the very top of the head too. If you look at the autopsy photo, she's got it, lacerations and and. It, it, that go into her skull on the very top as well, which is an mm -hmm. odd, I always thought everything was from behind because mm -hmm. you see that one autopsy photo where it looks like a big seven in the back of her head in different directions, the the gouging. And she she seems to have been attacked in various states of moving around or or falling or standing and then down on the ground and then down on the ground. So it's hard to, is, I would like somebody to tell me based on the wound pattern, what happened to her? Stephanie, dead is dead. I know, I know, I know. Dead is dead. I mean, it, it's obvious that whoever did this wasn't happy with her. I mean, uh, without question, you know, if, if you just want to kill somebody, you know, you, it, it doesn't take 11 or 18 uh wax to do that i keep forgetting which one got the 18 or 19 the other one got the 11 it wasn't 40 and 41 because that she didn't... got 19 and he got 11 11 okay so 19 she got the most 11. Yes. yes and uh and if you if you stop and visualize that eight 19 times i have okay yes. that is not somebody who just wanted to kill her beyond that you know and uh, so the last thing I, I do want to mention, because I thought about this when you asked me to come on this show, uh, if we turn the criminal justice system upside down yep, yep. and, you know, the way it is right now that the prosecution has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that a crime was committed and that a certain person, the defendant, committed that crime. What if at the same time, at the same time, the defendant had to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that they didn't commit the crime and that the jury, the 12 people who weren't smart enough to get out of jury duty, had to listen to both those stories and then decide what it is. Because, see, the, the, the jury never gets the full story the way the criminal justice system is created, you know? Now, I mean, you know way better than me all the things, the various aspects of the case. What could she possibly say to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that she didn't do this. Well, she didn't need the money. So that motive of financial Oh, she gain, didn't need the money. She wanted money. She, she wanted didn't more. need it. She, had, they, she and them uh, had money in the bank. They had allowance every year. They never had to work a day in their lives. They had their wardrobes made for them by a seamstress twice a year. Mm -hmm. They had their their extras. Lizzie went to Europe in 1890 for 19 weeks and Andrew paid for the whole thing. They were able to get out of him everything they wanted to get out of him. Well, what if he died? What if he time. died before his wife? Well, it turns out that Massachusetts law at the time would have been a third, a third and a third. Not all of it to Abby because she's the second wife and not the mother of the children. So it would have been a third, a third, and a third. So okay. with that, they what would else? have had to share. What else? What else, Stephanie? She doesn't have any blood on her. Sorry, she doesn't have any blood on her. 
Well, not only did she not have any blood on her, there was no blood trails. Very typically, you know, yes, whoever yes, had that hatchet, they planned it. They obviously put it in a bag or something because there were no blood trails anywhere. No bloody anywhere. footprints, no bloody right. hands on door frames, no, no, no transfer that's right. blood. No, that's right. That's right. Why was that? And when they searched the house for clothing they didn't find the dress she burned on sunday they didn't find anything that was bloody they didn't find any evidence that she had incriminated herself with being present at each crime there was nothing there was no evidence okay so she had no well but most cases by the way are made with on circumstantial evidence Yes. Yes. We, you know, and every everybody thinks that every case no, has a spoken the, gun, like on television. All no. the t, all the shows, the real crime shows on television. There's always a smoking gun. Eventually, there there isn't. You know, it's 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 a collection of circumstantial evidence. So now you mentioned that she didn't have any blood and she didn't need the money. What else? Let's see. You what haven't else? convinced me beyond a reasonable doubt. Oh well. Okay. Let's see. She uh, she was outside when it happened. Her alibi is true. She wasn't in the house when her father was killed. How do we know it's true? We just have to believe her testimony. How can <laughs> you not believe her testimony? <laughs> yeah, but she has nobody that can prove that. She does. She has uh, Hyman Lubinsky, who was the ice cream peddler, who saw her coming in from the backyard towards the house. Did he know her? Did he know her? He knew he knew Bridget and he knew it wasn't her and he identified her that is the person he saw. Okay. What else? Well, that's a big deal. It is. Yeah. Because she wasn't expecting to have a witness to see her coming back into the house. She wasn't, mm -hmm. she didn't plan that. And here's this Russian peddler, 19 years old, who's driving his horse cart, you know, down the road and he looks over and he sees her. Mm -hmm. And he notes the time, which is interesting in and of itself. So she has a bit of an alibi with that. She also, her story about being in the barn can't be disputed because the police officer's, quote, experiment was proven not to have been worthy of being presented as evidence because those kids had been up there and disturbed a lot before he had went up there and he didn't notice their footprints. So how does that prove, how does that prove she didn't kill the parents? Well, it proves that she could have been in the barn. Like she said, she was, it could, she could have. So the, the kids romping around in the barn actually gives her story a little credence. The basket that she said she went to on in the barn loft was really there. So they found the basket. Her alibi of being downstairs or in the kitchen or downstairs in the cellar when stepmother is killed, that I can't I can't speak to that. I can't speak mm -hmm. to that at all. She's how many times though does somebody have an experience similar to this? And then I mean, how do you lock into your brain what you did every second of that day and where you were and that, get it right that, that's why it's very important for the police to get to to this crime scene remember i mentioned stop time you right. got to try to stop time for that very reason and she she needed to be interviewed as soon as possible by one person uh so that didn't happen you know, un unfortunately, she was upset. Some people said she didn't look like she was upset. Some people said she she was, etc. Well, but her sister, her sister was allowed to clean the blood so that when the funeral happened on Saturday, you know, all the blood was gone off the yeah, wall. Now, the door. Now, now we have companies, crime scene uh, cleaning companies, literally, that right. does that. Does, yeah. And the insurance pay in, in your insurance pays for it. Oh, yeah, they There's do. You know, the thing is, in any case, you know, I've I've worked on many cases and it, I always get asked, do you think he did it? Yes or no. And I say, I don't know. 
right. just don't. All I do is collect evidence and facts. And then our system of justice, our system of justice doesn't care who commits the crime. That's the problem. Our system does not, for example, everybody in the world knows O.J. Simpson killed his ex-wife in Ron Goldman. Anybody with a common sense knows that. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, I have no problem with the fact that he got found not guilty, not because I don't think he did it, because I, mean, I know he did it. It's because the evidence wasn't presented properly. Our yeah. system of justice is you need to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. If you buy into that, I have because it's my, my business, then I have to be comfortable when it doesn't get done properly. What I hate about our criminal justice system are the, are the juries. The juries should not be making these decisions. Why? You know, they can be, they, because they can be swayed by good uh, attorneys. Attorneys are, were drama majors in college that didn't make it as an actor, so they went to law school, <laughs> okay? And the, the one who's the better actor wins cases. And I'm not, and I'm not trying to be critical, but I'm just saying the reality is if you're a good attorney, for example, one of the reasons why I'm teaching a new course that I developed this semester, public speaking for criminal justice professionals, because our students need to ensure that they have good public speaking skills. If they're out in the street, part of the reasons why there are problems with law enforcement, where they're taking their guns out when they shouldn't, because their inability to handle situations through oral communications. In the law, I've seen a lot of real, tell you, I just did a case again in Washington state and the defense attorney was Ted Bundy's attorney. Mm, yeah. And I got to tell you, I was not impressed. You know, mm. I was on the stand for a day and a half. And he wasn't asking me the right questions. I was, oh, wow. He wasn't asking me the right question. So you uh, would you would propose a trial by judge only? Absolutely. A, ju for, a panel. For capital a judge cases? Panel. For a capital judge panel. Well, I don't care for any case. I, I just think that we're trying to have 12 people who don't want to be there. Let's face it. Anytime well, no, you I hear do. It, if I get called for jury duty, I always want to be there. That's why you're never going to get selected. Oh, I am. I was selected twice. <laughs> you were? Mm -hmm. Really? Oh, my yeah. God. You must have lied about something. No, no. I was on a condemnation case. It was, still took 12 jurors, but uh, it was it was uh, about, about property that had been condemned for a road expansion. You know, for, for example, I would never get anybody like me, anybody with my background, wouldn't get selected because I know, I you understand, know I understand what's going to be talked about. They yeah. don't want people who understand. It. Yeah. You yeah. Know, that's, well, yeah. yeah, they can throw you out because you're prejudicial yeah. because you yeah. have too much information. Uh, you know, and, you know, those, the jurors way back in uh, 1893. All men. All men, you know, and there was this mindset that women didn't have the capability to commit those kind of crimes, although uh, that's been proven wrong. They took 10 the minutes. They took the a whole years. 10 minutes to decide. Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, and then you know. they and then they got famous. Because, so they every year the jurors would get together and have a little party and remember their time on the case. And and every year it would be in the paper if one of them died. And so there was this article I read, the last juror of the boarding case has died, you know, and yeah. it's like a deal. It's like a fame mm -hmm. that came from mm -hmm. it. So it creates its own uh, celebrity. Yeah. 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 So I haven't convinced you that Lizzie didn't do it by. Uh, no, no, I, I, I don't know. You don't know. I no, don't know. I don't know. Nobody know. Nobody knows. And, and nobody will ever know. If anybody thinks for one minute there's something out there that's going to prove one way or another, they're just. Deluded. Well, my problem is that like when we went to like Bill Spencer did his talks at the library on August 4th, August 3rd and 4th, and he was talking about how you need to look at evidence and how you need to read things in order to discriminate between fiction and as close to the truth as you can get with this case. And they, this woman still insisted that, oh, well, what about Arnold Brown and the illegitimate son? And still brought up Brown when his, he has this entire huge chapter in the second book Lizzie Borden uncut, where he just gives Brown the finger because he just makes up everything. Yeah. 
and yeah. and she still holds it close to her as the solution because it's a conspiracy that's involved in that book. It's a conspiracy where everybody, everybody wants a conspiracy. Everybody wants a conspiracy. I don't want a conspiracy. So no, no, what, not you. But I'm but saying. But what do you people... think causes people to be intrigued and uh, if attracted to the conspiracy idea in this case? I. Uh, it was a well-written book. I will give him that. Mm -hmm. It was entertaining as all get out. Mm -hmm. And when you're reading it, you're like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. But when you're done with it, you're like, hey, footnote, any footnotes? No. Any sources? No. Where well, do you get all, the information? all the conspiracy theories just confuse the obvious sometimes, you know, um, look at all the conspiracy uh, theories in the JFK assassination, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, to a point where you just don't know what the situation is. Look at today, the, uh, the history books, 50 years from now, I'm dying to see yeah, really. about, about what we're doing here today in the United States. I agree States. with you. You know, That'll be an interesting uh, and, it, and it's any, it's whoever's writing it. You know, I, I just got interviewed. There's a new uh, series. They just, they're doing the pilot. And I was interviewed uh, for the pilot on Sunday about an uh, interesting case here in Maryland. They, they took a group of Menza people, these brainiac people, right? Yeah. And they're using them to try to solve uh, cold cases, okay? And the only information they have is what the media is telling them. No. And they're, and they're sitting there like, they know all the facts. In this case, the FBI said this person committed suicide. The the the, uh, the medical examiner in Pennsylvania says it's murder, and they they sealed the autopsy report, everything because they're saying, "Hey, it's a murder, so we're still under investigation," kind of thing. The media, they have a job to do, and they don't care about the facts. I know. I get interviewed by them all the time, like the Luminol. The Luminol was going to say in in the case we did wasn't going to prove anything but no, it was perfect. it was visual yes in fact i don't know if you know this or not that the camera did wouldn't pick it up right i heard that so and they 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 shipped in a special yep. lens yeah and it still didn't pick it up they had to do it in post yeah yeah add it yeah. yeah yeah but i tell you i saw it and it was amazing how it it it, it glowed in a very characteristic way that blood, any liquid uh, would have. So, so you were amazed at that moment as well, when you were standing there and you saw that blood and you were like, No, I didn't see that blood. I saw a reaction. That's all okay, I saw. Okay, so you saw okay. the reaction to the luminol on the 115-year-old blood. And yeah. I would have just been. No, see, no, that is not. I saw a reaction to something. Okay. okay 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 it may have been blood okay. and it and it certainly was right below where his head would have been you right. know and right. etc i uh, certainly had some kind of reaction uh, so to the something. stuff you have in the paper bag though if that turns out to be blood then then we know that yeah that would be cool that would, that would be, be cool. cool okay yeah so there's no backward looking dna on the case you can't go back and find dna and what what good would it do because you don't have anybody's DNA in the family except that blood, which may be Andrew's, but there's mm. nothing to compare it to. So there's no need for that. Murder weapon has never been found. There was no poison in their systems, although honestly, they didn't test for every poison or every known substance that could kill you. They tested for obvious ones like arsenic, but there's scientifically, there isn't really we, anything we can look at again in order to get us any closer to anything. We yeah. always have to look at the characters of the individuals involved in the story, what they had to gain, what their motives, but see motive has nothing to do with a criminal case, right? You don't talk motive in court. Well, remember Scott Peterson, the one that allegedly oh, yeah. killed, okay. that There was not one piece of physical evidence in that case. And he was found guilty and got the death penalty, even though that's been commuted to, now to life. But there was not one piece of physical evidence to prove that he killed his wife and unborn born child. It was the circumstances. All right, then, when the girlfriend came up, then that just made the case. All right. You know, the, but you know, there he is. He's on a Christmas morning. He's going fishing uh, on Christmas, Christmas morning. He's going fishing, not down the street. No, no, like 70 miles away. And then when they find 
uh, the wife's body and an unborn child, it's floating in, in water up there where he was fishing. Right. You know, right. all right. So a logical and prudent individual would say, okay, what else do we need to know? And now he's got a girlfriend on the side that he, we didn't know about. You know, right. all those things cause the jury to believe that a crime was committed and that he committed it to a point where they gave him the death penalty. Right. They were you know? really convinced. Yeah, no physical evidence, just the circumstances. The problem with the uh, Lizzie Borden case is all the circumstances that we, the, a lot of circumstances that we could have had didn't happen because the police just didn't do, uh, do the right kinds of things. If they had literally moved everybody out, if they searched and looked at every single nook and cranny of that house and found every possible dress, if they found that dress that she allegedly burned, do you believe she burned the dress? Yeah, she did burn a dress. Yeah. She admits okay. to, I mean, okay. Emma saw her do it. Okay. Whether there was paint on it or blood, we don't know. We don't right. know. Right. Okay. But let's face it. Her parents just died and she's worrying about a dirty dress. I know. Well, there's also, there's also the, uh, did she actually turn over the correct dress to the police that she was wearing that day? Oh, we I know. You know, because everybody saw, of, everybody had a different idea of what she was wearing, and most people didn't notice. Mm -hmm. She had so many yeah. things going in her direction. <laughs> I have to say, mm -hmm. from just it being eighteen ninety two to the police not there because they're off on their jaunt to no crime scene protocols to no uh, protocol no uh, medical examiners what protocols did they have i'm sure they didn't have any no they didn't you know what did no. they do i mean they did them on the dining and they did they really do them on the dining room table well they took out the no they had a they brought in a a, a board one of those uh autopsy boards with the the like wicker like, yeah and they set it up in the in the sitting room and they took out his stomach there so they immediately mm -hmm. preserved the stomachs on both of them. Getting her downstairs must have been a trip, let me tell you, because they had to pick her up and move her downstairs and do the same thing. Uh, there's mm -hmm. pictures of him lying on the board, but there's no pictures of her lying on the board. But mm -hmm. that makes sense because they would have had to, you know, cut away her clothing and that would have been improper to take. And, and we don't know how many times those bodies were moved. Nope. You nope. Know, we, you know, we, we have these pitch, these crime scene pictures. They're not of, really crime scene pictures. They were taken at 3.30 in the afternoon. That's right. After so, people yeah. had been repositioned. So well, it was a crime scene, though. But I mean, they. We, yeah. I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Um, so we don't know what position they really were in. No. First and, and that's why I was wondering about the actual, you know, the the wounds pattern, the pattern of the wounds might tell us the position that they were struck in, where they were standing and where they were kneeling and that kind of thing, which again, would not bring us any closer to the killer, but would provide more detail to the story, to the, to the crime itself. I don't know. It's not typically a woman's crime to take a hatchet to somebody, although it's been done women kill with knives and things like that from before that time. Her prussic acid venture is a unique thing to think about because it's such an odd poison. Something you said uh, in the um, show with uh, Bill, I loved, and you, and you made it very clear that that's used also to clean metal. It is. It was, and, it, it was manufactured and, in Fall River. Yeah. Yeah. And that could be the, the real reason why she uh, wanted to get some of that. Well, it certainly would have removed the blood from the hatchet if she had. Yeah. Had the acid. Yeah. 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 Because yeah. Bill's and, convinced, Bill Spencer's convinced that they were going to bring in th two more or three more pharmacists from New Bedford. They were on the witness list, but mm -hmm. were not called because the prussic acid testimony was disallowed. And so he wonders why they were bringing in pharmacists from New Bedford. She had been in New Bedford the week before. Mm -hmm. So they he was wondering whether they had evidence that she had asked for um, prussic acid from them as well. And that they were going to testify to that. Yeah. So who yeah. knows? I mean, I don't know. It's, you know, we go over the same facts over and over and over trying to squeeze out a drop of something new and 
I can't. There's nothing there. Well, I can't, I can't, every once in a while I'll, I'll go, wait, wait, wait. And then it's not, it's not anything. It's no. just, it's just no, not anything. I, I, I really appreciate it. Again, I keep saying it. And I, 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 I don't know if I talked to Bill or we, we emailed each other. I'm not sure after his first book, because I really enjoyed it. And I really appreciated getting all those, all, all those, that information in one place, you know, that again, he keeps calling factual. I would stop calling it factual. It's just, okay. it's, it's documented information, not necessarily factual. <laughs> Right. I sent him an email. I sent him an email when his second book came out and just told him I I had ordered it and wait I was waiting for it to come. (laughs) (laughs) So we don't we'll we'll never know and we'll never know for sure. And we'll never be able to prove it one way or the other. Is that what we're no? I mean, there's cases right now that we never know for sure. I mean, I've worked cases that just happened and and that are done with, and they just, and all the, as much of the right things happen, we still don't know beyond a, a reasonable doubt. Unless you have a video watching them commit the crime, it's very <laughs> difficult to prove one way or the other, you know? Mm-hmm. And though we get, we're getting that a lot more with everybody's, uh, uh, I just got my I, uh, iPhone uh, 14 ordered. It hasn't come yet, but, uh, <laughs> but, but we have, you know, everybody has some of the best cameras in the world in their hands all the time. So you were a part of a group of 40 professional investigators and forensic scientists who work to solve unsolved crimes. And mm-hmm. while I don't want to get any in too deep into any of these cases, even though people have heard of them before, a lot of them, you call yourself what, the case breakers? Is case breakers, right? yeah. And mm-hmm. have you solved any ice cold cases, do you think? We think we have, but uh, getting the evidence to prove one way or the other has been very difficult. For example, the D.B. Cooper, you remember D.B. Cooper? Yeah. Well, we uh, believe- well, D.B. Cooper was uh, the first big hijacking where he jumped out of the plane yeah. with the money in at night over yeah. what, Oregon or Washington state? Uh, started in Washington, but over Oregon and all that stuff. And yeah. he jumped out of the plane and he was never seen again and they right. never found him and they never found the money. Although they found some money that washed up on shore somewhere, some yes. of the bills. Uh, on a river, yeah. yeah on a, a riverbed, river. right. But anyways, we, we identified a person that we believe was him. His name was Rackshaw. He just died two years ago. And uh, trying to get the FBI to even talk with him, it's just impossible. So to answer your question, we believe we have a lot of evidence to prove that, that this guy did it. No, But the problem is we don't have a smoking gun. Now, the Zodiac murders in California, Mm -hmm. we have somebody who we believe is the Zodiac killer. We have his DNA. We have spent shells from his gun that he was shooting out in the backyard that we'd like to test against the shells left behind in one one or two of those cases. Mm -hmm. And the police won't even talk to us. Why? Because it's not them. It's not them. That's all I can say. I don't know. Yeah, you know, we even went to the attorney general in um, California. Said, so "Listen, you know, we we appreciate your cooperation here. Listen, if we're wrong, just test it. You know, for example, we have his DNA. They have DNA in one in one of those murders. They have good DNA. All we're asking is that you test it." They said, "It's not him." Well, then who is it? Right, right. You know what I mean? I said, you know, prove us wrong. You know, make us put egg on our face. We don't mind. This is why the the Golden State Killer got away with it for so long, because they Uh they just, you know, it took individuals working really hard to to open it up again and create a public interest. Forensic genealogy is just wonderful. That is the, you know, but DNA, obviously, in 1984, when Dr. Jeffrey in uh, England invented the process that revolutionized investigations. Forensic genealogy is getting to be damn close to it. Obviously, it uses DNA uh, to be able to make some cold cases. And it's interesting, a dear friend of mine who's a forensic genealogist, she was advised by a a forensic science professional organization that what she did wasn't forensic science. Therefore she could not be a full member, which was absurd. 
And then after all these cases have been made, uh, I was going <laughs> to, at, at the next meeting, I was going to make a motion that we give this person in the whole forensic genealogy community an apology, but uh, they pleaded with me not to do that, so I didn't. <laughs> no, oh no. But that's true. As I mean, if it they hadn't sent the DNA off to that genealogy site and found some kind of hit from some relative, and then that yeah. was traced. Yeah. I mean, they were trying to do that with actually Jack the Ripper. They were trying to do forensic genealogy with Jack the Ripper, and mm -hmm. it kind of fizzled. So mm -hmm. they do that with big cases like that. They did, tried to do it, I think, with H. Well, H. H. Holmes. Everybody knew that he was a killer, mm -hmm. but he didn't kill as many people as legend has it. So let me tell you about H. H. Holmes. I the production the production company in England called me up. And they wanted to build a dollhouse of his the man, castle, his castle, castle right, right. right? And they wanted to fly me to England, and you know, and they were going to build this thing, and they're going to use, you know, because I, I. By the way, I want everybody to know I have never played with a dollhouse, nor have I ever <laughs> built a dollhouse. Um, and uh, anyways, they wanted me to do it for free. Uh, uh -huh. And I say, I'm sorry, y'all uh -huh. getting paid. I need to get paid. Exactly. Uh, no, but you're going to get a free trip to England. Ooh. And they had done that, you know. <laughs> so um, I I didn't go. But they ended up doing the show. Anyway, I never saw it. Well, the I, legend about the dungeon and the doors that go in it don't go anywhere. And I mean, when they when it's all um, some of it is fancy and it's not actual truth about the makeup of that building by the way it, for the audience uh this this happened in chicago right in 1893 ish time when lizzie was visiting chicago for the chicago world's fair was uh, yeah she didn't get a room at the uh oh, at, stop. At his, oh, stop. <laughs> it would have saved the parents from oh stop <laughs> from, oh. from demise <laughs> Oh no! Can you imagine? Well, what are you what are you doing now? What are you working on now besides all these TV shows that keep contacting you and asking you to? Be I tell on? you, I'm trying to really retire. You know, I retired from the government in 2012. You know, I've been teaching for 40. I'm I'm on my 46th year, and uh, I, I I'm I'm wanting to kind of slow down from that. You know, I I finally found somebody who is going to teach my course. You know, I've been teaching this forensic course for 45 years. I was the only one in the department and she's a fingerprint examiner, uh, US Department of Treasury. So she's teaching one of my three sections this semester. Next semester, I'm giving her two of the three. Meanwhile, I created this course, Public Speaking for Criminal Justice Professionals. While I'm trying to retire, I'm building, I'm developing new things. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, I don't, I don't get that many cases. I only get onesies and twosies, which I love doing. I love to analyze in a, for the defense. And some people say, how can you work for the defense? I'm not interested in, in, in helping a person who's, who's committed a crime to go free. But I am interested in ensuring that justice prevailed. And people keep forgetting that it's about the truth. You know, if the truth is, you know, is, is going to cause somebody to be let free because proper evidence isn't there, then so be it, you know, and I try to get to my students to let them never forget that it's about the truth. That's all the truth. And when you if the truth affects your case and it makes it go the other way, then you're still done your job. You know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, it amazes me where DNA has proven certain people who've been who've spent yep. most of their life in, in, in prison when when they finally get let out and the prosecution will still say the person we did the case, the jury uh, found him guilty and we disagree with this. What, what do you disagree with? All right. Or make them take an Alfred plea just to get out of jail when there's when when they don't want to retry it because they know they'll lose. You know, that Baltimore case where they did the serial podcast, you know, yeah. it was one of the first podcasts. It's called the serial uh, where this person was allegedly killed his girlfriend, you know, that his ex-girlfriend. Well, his defense team have been trying to get him out. He's been in prison for almost over two, 20 years. Well, just yesterday, 
it was reported that Baltimore City Prosecutor's Office is asking the judge to let him free, that they have new evidence. They're not saying he's not guilty, but they're saying they have new evidence to establish two other people that may uh, were involved and uh, that there was evidence that was held and not uh, given to the defense. OK, so this kid, he's not a kid anymore. You know, he's in his, you know, his 40s now. You know, this happened in 1998, I believe. And it's nice to hear that the prosecution is willing to say that. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Because you know? they're not always willing to do that. No, no, they're not. Uh, it's it's you see that in some of these Netflix documentaries where everything is you're rooting for the person who's been accused because you don't believe they did it based on what's happened. And these people won't step back. They won't yeah. they won't let it be. They their pride is too big. They can't apologize. Now, I know, Stephanie, you're younger than I am, but. I watched a show, a TV show every week when I was a young person that if, that really affected my view of the criminal justice system. And that Dragnet? was, Pe uh, no, Perry Mason. No, <laughs> Perry Mason. I love Perry Mason. Perry I Mason, every Perry client Mason. he had, not only did he get him found not guilty, but he, he proved that he didn't do it. I know. And I used to think the prosecutor was the bad guy. Yeah. Yeah. I really did. You know? And it wasn't until later on I realized, wait a minute now, he's not the bad guy. And, and Perry Mason is a myth. You know, it's just. Oh, yeah, because nobody confesses. Every one of the people who did it confess. Oh, they jump or, up and at they, the they, end of the show. They jump up. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? But they're fun. And Raymond Burr is the best. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you can't you can't take that. I love that show. Yeah. And still watch it. Yeah. It holds yeah. it holds uh, it holds up after all this time, unlike other yeah. TV shows from that era. Yeah. yeah. So to answer your question, I really am trying to get this app. It's very difficult to try to convince law enforcement. Oh, is that, it? Oh, God. Because right away, you know, you, I talk to chiefs of police and they'll say, wait a minute, our people are trained. I'm not suggesting they're not trained. I'm not suggesting they're not smart. I'm simply saying that it's difficult to remember everything that needs to be done, observations that need to be made, questions that need to be asked. And this right. checklist just allows them to do that. And by the way, the new generations coming up, if it's not on their phone, they don't want to, they're not going to deal with it. You know, you know, someone said, well, we've had checklists for years. Where are they? Show yeah. me what draw they're in. You know, <laughs> yeah, really. You Is know, it an uphill battle? Oh God! I mean, and I, I created. I mean, I, I produced this with my own funds. I didn't get a grant or anything out like of that. You know, and but I just think it's it's really important. I'm so I'm going to continue to try to push for that. You know, while I'm still uh, in your uh, retirement, don't, don't, in my in my retirement. In but your retirement. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think I'm within a couple of years of kind of hanging up teaching, but uh, not uh, just because I, I, I play pickleball almost every morning. Yeah, you said you said you I love it. Yeah. I love pickleball. It drives my wife crazy because we you going to play pickleball again today. I said, yes, <laughs> I am. Yes, I am. But uh, I enjoy that. Enjoy the social thing. It, it's the biggest craze around the country right now. It's, yeah, it's amazing. It's funny. It Amazing. seems like an old fashioned game to me. Um, like it used what, to be. What do you mean there. by that? It seems like something from the 19th century. I don't know why. First of all, the name pickleball. And second yeah. of all. You know where the name came from? Yeah, the people because the balls used to be kept in pickle jars, right? No, 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 no. <laughs> God, where did you get that? Oh, my goodness. No. The people who invented the game in the six, 1960s. Yeah. Uh, one of the guys, their dog was named Pickles. And he'd go, Pickles would always run after to get the balls for them. Okay? Oh. And that's where that stupid name Pickles came Pickle from. Pickleball. Yeah. Got it. So it's named after yeah. a, a dog. Oh, yeah. that's sweet. Yeah. But anyways, oh. I hope this has been helpful. I've enjoyed this very much. Well, so have I. Yeah. It's always good yeah. to talk to you, Tom. Always. Yes. Always, it's, always, because you're yeah. the pro. Yeah, right, right. And 
although the audience listened to this can't tell, but we, we got to look at each other while we were talking, which was oh, really you're nice. you going to rub it in that we're not using video. Okay. <laughs> but um, anyway. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time and thank your you. expertise. And it's always good to see you and to talk to you. And uh, keep in touch. Seriously. I will. I will. Okay. I will. Thanks, Tom. Thank you for the invite. Okay. Thank you for listening to the Lizzie Borden Podcast, Episode 20. We've been talking to Tom Moriello, author, criminologist, consultant, and educator, on his unique perspective on the Borden case. Find Richard Barron's Lizzie Borden Girl Detective stories at Amazon.com and at LizzieBordenGirlDetective.com, where you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Listen to more Lizzie Borden podcasts on our website or on Podbean, Audible, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, Spotify, and YouTube. If you like what you're hearing, please consider supporting this podcast by subscribing to it on patreon.com.